Hello, everyone. Welcome to January's Sensibility podcast or newsletter video edition. Um, my uh, interviewee for today is Maggie Burrows. She is based in the UK. Um, I've known her for a couple of years now and always admired her work um, and specifically her um, attention to detail on subjects that I think are very interesting. Um, so she did a, a recent series on the sphincter muscles um, and in my estimation that's a very subtle aspect of the body and it requires quite a degree of fine attention that you only get when you have a, a kind of meditative approach to life. Um, so that's why I wanted to reach out to Maggie to see if she would like to do this interview. Uh, again, the subject matter for this month is Feldenkrais and Meditation. And um, I'm very much looking forward to speaking with Maggie about the subject because she is quite knowledgeable, knowledgeable about, about it. Um, so Maggie, I don't know if you'd want to just uh, do a little introduction for yourself, tell people who you are. Uh, OK, yeah. So I um, uh, came across Feldenkrais uh, back in the 1980s. And um, uh, a, a couple of people who trained at Amherst, Christopher Connolly and Garrett Newell, had come over to uh, Britain with the intention of running a training. And I was really lucky um, that Garrett moved into my hometown and mm -hmm. uh, started a, a local class. And I had been looking for something without really realising it um, uh, because I wanted to I was singing um, and I wanted to improve my own voice. And I wanted to teach voice. And so uh, very shortly after doing a workshop with Garrett, a workshop in which I, I sort of went in in pain. I had um, uh, sciatica irregularly at the time and it had come on the night before um, and had gone at the end of the day. And that was much quicker than it usually went. So I had a, a nice um, piece of information to tell me that it might be something that would work for me. Mm. So it only took me a few days to realise that I wanted to do the training. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and uh, I think I was very lucky that I what I brought to the training was absolutely no experience in in any other area except a um, little bit of Tai Chi, a little bit of dance, a little mm -hmm. bit of singing, all of which blend very nicely with Feldenkrais. So I didn't have to unlearn any habits of um, uh, that that made the method hard for me to make sense of. I didn't really have a lot of questions. The whole training just made sense to me. It was mm -hmm. great, and it was the um, the first training in London. We qualified in 1990, mm -hmm. and I have been doing mostly Feldenkrais ever since, with a bit of singing. Okay, and so you teach in London, do you currently? I teach in London now. Yes, I I, I used to work in Brighton. Okay, but now London does feel bit like home I've been here a nice long time okay and and so I mean just uh, like uh, as we kind of go into this subject what um can you describe what you feel like the connection is between Feldenkrais and meditation like, like is there a connection do you like and then how do you understand that uh if it's okay to whiffle on a bit <laughs> I, I I've had a lot of chronic Ill, Ill health from a very early age and um, quite, I was quite young when I realised that it had a neurotic element, that there was an emotional aspect to um, the symptoms I was experiencing. But I experienced a lot of symptoms. And so I was in my 20s really looking for answers to why I was having all the difficulties I was having. Mm -hmm. And I read a lot of books that's, that where someone described their problems and how they cured them with meditation. Mm -hmm. Now, this is this is 40 years back. Um, I can't list those books as easily as I wish I could. I wish I'd made more notes at the time. I was a big library user at the time. Um, but I remember thinking this subject of meditation comes up so much. Um, however, I was useless at meditating. And um, I joined a class where I would worry until I fell asleep. And we were all sitting up with our legs crossed and our hands softly resting in our laps. And it was a very small room. And if you fall asleep in a very small room where everyone's sitting up, you essentially do this. And so I was lunging forwards and disrupting the whole class. So I just had to give it up. And I did 
have a wonderful experience with um, a hypnosis teacher. Uh, my partner of the time treated me to some hypnosis and that did really help me relax, but I couldn't figure out how to do it for myself. And I couldn't afford to keep going to the, um, to the practitioner. So in, in relation to that, just, just quickly. So I, hypnosis is kind of like guided. So someone's voice that you're following was the meditation similar to that, or was it just like you sit in silence Oh, good question. I think we were sitting in silence more. I think it was a very Buddhist uh, process. Yeah, yeah. But, you know, this, as I say, it's a long way back, that class. So it's like, um, if, like in the process of listening to your own thoughts and whether. Yeah, you... yeah, yeah. I was someone who had a lot of thoughts. Now, I think there's a lot of us out there. Um, and I think people like me struggle to find that meditative quiet. And then I started doing Tai Chi mm -hmm. and that, that was a revelation moving slowly and attentively and paying attention to my breathing, which is how my teacher taught us, uh, took away what I felt was the need to find something that was quieting my thoughts. I was quieting something else. I was feeling that kind of benefit. And then, of course, I I, I went into Feldenkrais and Feldenkrais, we were chatting before this interview started and we were talking about the bell hand. It was a revelation for me, the effect of this soft, slow, persistent movement of the hands, the change it made to my state of over anxiety, mm -hmm. anxiety that I had lived with all my life. So I wasn't very aware of it. Yeah. Because that's that's who I was. Mm -hmm. um, but that first year of the training, I was very much my normal self. I lurked in corners and avoided people mm -hmm. and just so observed what was going on. Very comfortable in the observing role. By the second year, I would come into the room and think, oh, who shall I go and sit with? Who shall I go and talk to? It made a huge difference to my ability to cope with social activity. Mm -hmm. but, uh, and that was wonderful to discover. And I and since then, I suppose I have been that's the part of the work that I was aware was particularly beneficial for my set of health issues mm -hmm. and was um, interested always in expanding that part of my understanding. OK, so um, if, if I then just go back quickly to a couple of the things that you've mentioned. Yeah, yeah. So you've mentioned the kind of the active thoughts of and you know struggling with um a more classical meditation practice that's just like sit with your thoughts or sit in silence and try and regulate find regulation through that process that mm -hmm. that wasn't necessarily accessible um then you mentioned the hypnosis and you felt that that was easier for you to get into that and I'm maybe putting words in your mouth, but you found that was easier to get into the, a quieter state. I had four sessions. Okay. And the final session mm -hmm. just went by. Okay. And uh, when he brought me back, I had just been unaware mm -hmm. for the whole hour. Okay. And that had, that hasn't easily happened since. I still don't easily get to that state. Right. Often. Um, and but the, the 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 net positive was that you felt quieter afterwards. There was some kind of tangible benefit to that. I felt the anxiety had gone. Mm, okay. uh, and, and and what he said to me was he said, be very careful when you're outside because you're not going to be as alert as you usually are. Okay. Okay. Used to living with a very high level of alertness. I understand that. And then um you mentioned Tai Chi. Mm. Uh, has the the as as you said as you stated like slow movement with attention mm. um, and you found that also meditative you found that that would regulate you in some way I it made an enormous improvement to one of my main symptoms was um, asthma lots of respiratory issues it made a big difference to my asthmatic mm -hmm. uh, condition um, we were doing the form with constant reverse breathing. Now I've been to other teachers since and not found 
doing that as part of it. I might do it for myself, but the teacher hasn't insisted on it. My first teacher, that was how he taught the form. Yeah. And I, I had a, a, a major change in the um, uh, in my breathing health, okay. my respiratory health, that um, once I shifted over to doing Fathom Christ and my teacher moved away, my Tai Chi teacher moved away, eventually the form fell by the wayside yeah. and other factors interfered with my breathing health. Um, uh, I have been a cigarette addict in my life and I had, um, taken up smoking again for all kinds of stupid reasons. Um, and it took me a long time to get back off it. And that certainly reversed the benefits I got from the Tai Chi, I think for okay. a long time. So, um, I'd be interested in, uh, asking you, maybe we'll get to breathing later. I'll mm. be interested in asking you what reverse breathing is i personally know the answer but just for the benefit of the people that don't um yes I, yes I like to go into that but maybe we'll we'll cover breathing as a separate thing as we go through this uh, yes my, my next question is like can you track like ag again you mentioned the, the a lesson called the bell hand mm. i think it may be useful for people to just have a bit of context about what that lesson is um and and maybe you can tie that in with how the feldenkrais method you found that you were able to access the more meditative quality that you were looking for in some of these other things to mm. help you with emotional mental physical regulation how you found that accessible through the feldenkrais method so i remember it as being uh, you know, we did a nice long period working with the bell hand, using it while moving, mm -hmm. um, uh, which I found very enjoyable. The, 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 I had taken up Tai Chi because I had to give up dance because I'd injured myself. And I was really enjoying the way Falmcrest was bringing these bigger, more expansive movements, the movements on the floor in particular, very much enjoying and just slowly getting the hang of the idea that you could be doing two things at once. Yeah. I think that there's a, a huge power in the fact that you are moving and breathing and paying attention to a soft, persistent movement of the hand. Mm -hmm. um, and I just, I just recognized that it was helping me. And I remember I was um, commuting and I was on the work crew for the training. So I had to get there early. Um, and I remember realizing running to the train that I could use the bell hand to bring myself back into a state of calm. Not only once I was on the train, but while running, I could do the bell hand. So it, 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 it became the first thing I think that I realized was a practical tool I could apply to my daily activity in a way that was beneficial. Mm. So that's like everything is that those yeah yeah I mean I, again I think it, I would I would really like if you kind of gave an actual description of what the bell hand is so oh that... yes 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 so 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 well this is how I teach it because I I'm obsessed with it but there you go <laughs> so uh so really to get people to sense both the front of the hand and the back of the hand and then to begin to move the fingers, and this is the way I describe it, that you're moving the tips of your fingers towards each other and making a rounded shape as if you was holding something in a safe way inside your hand, like you were protecting a little mouse or a butterfly or something like that. You mostly don't bring the fingers to touch because once they're, once your hand's touching something else, there's different information coming to you. But when the hand's just moving through the air, you're interacting with the air that the hand is sitting in. And then you don't squeeze or clench and you don't splay. Now, sometimes I teach a splay version, but you're not stretching the hand. You're not pulling the hand open. So it's moving between an easy, soft, rounded shape and a more closed, soft, rounded shape. And one of the metaphors I give people to help them understand it, it's like if you're holding a balloon and you're blowing it up, 
So you're holding the balloon. The balloon's very soft. It's not heavy. It's not hard for the hands to hold. And you blow in when the balloon gets bigger and your hands would just ride on the outside of the balloon and get a little bigger and a little smaller. Mm -hmm. I think what is fundamental, this is my understanding, mm -hmm. is that the whole hand is moving all the time. Mm -hmm. Often when I teach it, I'll see people and they're just doing something like this and they're not including the palm. This is why I, um, uh, I, I focus heavily on them feeling the hand rounding, rounding from a place that is, you know, one that you work with and explore in Tai Chi and Qigong a lot as well. But then as I sort of talk about that being the center around which everything is rounding. But I think it's the constant movement that it doesn't stop and start that is part of what is working so powerfully in the brain, in the nervous system. Uh, and, um, so, yeah, and then yeah. you could just add this to your breathing I, I when i meditate now i i usually at some point include some bell hand just naturally as part of it because i think where it works in a hypnotic way is that you're entraining yourself to recognize the calming value mm -hmm. of the movement and as you practice that the movement of the hand becomes capable of bringing you into that state just because you are engaging so carefully mm. with that process. Um, so a kind of follow up question that um, thank you for the description, by the way, that's really helpful. And I hope people that are watching try to follow along with that a little bit and maybe felt some of the benefit of it. Um, I have a I have a thought that um, it makes me think that meditation as it's classically pr proposed is really working on this mental level um you know working on the thoughts or the quietness of the mind and it isn't necessarily ever explicitly connected with the the, the physical state in some way you know like th there's a sense that regulation maybe can happen physical regulation can happen through the meditative process but yeah. there is necessarily such an emphasis on the mind and body being one system that is intimately connected and I wonder if you have any thoughts about how maybe the bell hand lesson you know it kind of like it it, it emphasizes the physicality of our psychological processes or, or something and I'm yeah 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 I mean I I because I've been writing about this I've been collecting quotes for a while um, none of which I'll be able to produce in an extemporized way. Um, uh, but, you know, there's a, a powerful quote from Buddha that the most powerful form of mindfulness is mindfulness centered on the body. Okay. Yeah. Um, so uh, that's when I started investigating what people meant when they were talking about mindfulness. That was one that kept popping up and felt very uh, obviously relevant to my family Christ and the Tai Chi and uh, mm. indeed any any movement that you can attend to in that clear way. So I know that includes elements of yoga as well. Yeah. Um, yoga obviously has a very powerful connection to meditative practices. I've talked myself into a corner and forgotten your exact question. Uh, well, I, I can just follow up. Hand, aren't we? Yeah, I can follow up with another question. So would you say that Feldenkrais is a form of mindfulness? Is it, is it a mindfulness practice? I think mindful is too small. And, and I think you're right in that that when people talk about it, many people talk as if it's mainly something you're doing with your thoughts. Right. Yeah. Um, but when I when I started to think about where the overlaps were, where the connections were, how this could be, how I could, um, because that's what I wanted to do, teach a meditative process that was fundamentally Feldenkrais, that mm -hmm. wasn't adjacent, but was actually sort of, you know, completely embedded in the way we work. Um, uh, I was thinking about several things. I was thinking about the uh, Wilder or Wilder, I'm not sure how his name is pronounced, Penfield, homunculus. Okay. And uh, homunculus is this... Um, uh, awkward looking creature that is an attempt at mapping the significant, the most significant parts of ourselves, the territory taken up by the most significant parts of ourselves in a sensory way and a motor way. 
Um, so the sensory motor, slightly different, these two homunculi, but they have very big hands. They have big feet. They have big lips, big eyes, big ears, big nostrils, all these areas of the brain that are disproportionately important to our daily processing. So one of the one of the simplifications that's offered is that the in the mental map of the or the, the the neurological map of the self, the thumb is bigger than the thigh. Because what your thigh does is very simple and what your thigh senses of the world is very simple compared to the complexity of the human thumb and, and what it's capable of. Mm. So one of the ideas that I had was was um, you uh, I've written about this. Um, I was asked to teach a workshop on eyes and I knew Feldenkrais had this great eye work, but I had missed it in the training because I would fall asleep all the time. Whenever he was teaching eyes, I would miss most of the lesson because I'd just drift off. And very, I'm wearing contact lenses today, but very neurotic early problems with my eyes. Couldn't see very well from very early on. And so I felt it was probably an emotional thing that I couldn't make it through a whole lesson, but it was a good challenge to teach a workshop. And at the end of the workshop, the group had felt a lot of benefit. And I thought, well, why did they get all this benefit? And I don't really, I've been preparing this workshop all week and I don't feel any huge benefit. Mm. And so I went back and I continued to play with it. And uh, Feldenkrais uses palming. Mm -hmm. He did a lot of training, I think, with his eyes. He uses palming, which is a real classic, very simple. Uh, cup one eye, cup the other eye block out as much of the light as you can and then close your eyes and then concentrate on the darkness of the visual field. It's, it's, a, it's deeply embedded in most eye training. Um, and so I did this and after, and because I was practicing it intentionally, uh, rather than just preparing the workshop and thinking, okay, that's how you do this. Then, you know, get, get, rushing through things perhaps a little in the week before, but in the week after where I thought, let's see if I can really feel the benefit of this. Doing this after five minutes, mm -hmm. I felt my whole system go into that quieter, softer state again. And it, this is not just mental, it's physical too. It's very recognizably the whole self changing. Mm -hmm. And then the light bulb came on over my head and I thought, well, what does this do? It's relaxing the eyes. And you hear various figures from 35% um, of our mental processing to 85 I've seen. Um, maybe for watching a very complicated and excited film, exciting film. Um, but even if we take that lower figure, so you, to take the 35% of the brain that is now resting because it's not processing anything visually and bring with it the hands, connecting the hands, relaxing and softening the hands, mm -hmm. that's going to uh, take up even more of this territory. Yeah. And Oliver Sacks talks about this. So I've got a, a lovely quote from him that I will not be able to reproduce, where he, but he basically says, look, language is, a, you know, a tiny part of our neurological processing that sits on a vast sea of movement. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so um, we were talking about sphincters before, and, you know, the, the sphincter relationships that the eyes are significant for is another area that, you know, we're relaxing something on the external surface that is connected deep through our whole system all the way down to the perineum. Yeah. Um, so there's something in perhaps both that uh, work with the eyes and work with the hand that is movement based, um, awareness based, that has a um, an internal influence that can be quite profound. You know, it's like working with the hand, relaxing some part of you that maybe is holding on too tight or working with the eyes and relaxing some of the work that the brain is doing to see mm. that has an overall system benefit where everything starts to calm down. And perhaps you get to, um, you get in the direction of the things that meditation practice is like the purpose of it, you know, mm. it's like, through doing yes. method you start to get some of the benefit of what the original what reason why we would do meditation 
Perhaps. Yes, yes. I, th I think that's very important. I have two things I want to say at once, which is going to be complicated. Um, mm -hmm. But but I think you've touched on something because much later in life, coming back to recognising that I was reading yet another book that was talking about a chronic issue um, and that being healed by meditation, yeah. I had started to ask my regulars, the people who were coming to me for lessons, um, do you do some form of meditation? What are you doing? And I was fascinated by the number of people who were doing forms of meditation and seemed to be getting no benefit from it. Yeah. Yeah. it, it was just something they were doing. Mm -hmm. um, and so for me, uh, it was, why weren't they asking why they weren't better? Yeah. Um, the book was uh, by a man called Tim Parks, who had very severe pain in his pelvis in the um, area of the prostate, but there didn't seem to be anything wrong with his prostate. And so he went on a long journey of discovery because he wasn't the kind of man who would just have an operation on his prostate because he was told to by a doctor. Yeah. And he ended up doing a real classic form of meditation that I, I if if I'm pronouncing it correctly, it's called Vipassana, yeah. uh, where you're um, sitting for long periods of time. You went on a long retreat, but essentially got rid of pain that no doctorly process, no medical process had helped him with to mm -hmm. the point where he was free of it. And I was dealing with chronic pain left over from chronic fatigue, a kind of fibromyalgic pain. And I, that's why I, I thought I, I really want to perfect this relationship now. Not Also, with the kind of pain I was dealing with, Feldenkrais didn't work as well as it had done before. When I was younger, the pains that I was managing responded very well to movement. Mm -hmm. But the pains I was dealing with with um, fibromyalgia did not respond so well to movement. Mm -hmm. And I had to be very, very gentle with my practice in order not to aggravate things. Mm -hmm. But to go into this extended or more complex version of what's often called the, I try and avoid the word body as much as I can. So I call it the self scan that we begin every um, awareness, through less, uh, awareness through movement lesson with. Um, using that process as a way of um, directly managing and easing pain. Mm. That's how I proved the power of it to myself, was, was that I actually had an effective result. It wasn't yeah. just something I was doing. But I also think that the thing that works for me very well in Feldenkrais and other similar systems is I am doing something. So instead of obsessively you know, moving around in my own thoughts. I am, you know, if if I'm counting breathing, that's enough for me to not, not think anything at all, but to have something very easy to come back to. Right. Um, uh, if I'm paying attention to my heartbeat or I'm looking at the visual field of blackness and, and seeing if I can let it be blacker, all of those things are active yeah. and um, enable me to, you know, it, it it it's a an old fashioned idea about computers. You know that if you sort of lock up the hard drive, the, so the computer is full, it won't work. Yeah, it's sort. Of, I feel like I'm filling up uh, my hard drive in some way by paying attention to my breathing and what I'm seeing with my eyes and what I'm sensing with my hands. I'm putting my attention in three different places at once. And that's very occupying. Mm -hmm. It allows everything else to. I, I think the term Feldenkrais uses is inhibition. It creates a, a state of inhibition in the system so that the whole system becomes quieter. Okay. So, I mean, in, in that specifically, because I think it's, it's quite an interesting aspect of the Feldenkrais method. So um, let's say that meditation practice is aimed at the inhibition of our thought process or the quietening of such a thing, right? Um, and what I think I'm hearing you say is that in you tracking or having your attention on certain bodily processes or certain movements um, or just an overall awareness of your physical state, that guided you to a calmer, quieter state more effectively than 
a classical meditation process which is more just observational i guess you know yes yes the, the activeness of tracking something tracking a movement or tracking a state or tracking your visual field had some benefit in relation in relation to your thoughts quieting down or your deepening awareness of yourself yeah engaging with the nervous system engaging with your um uh, this enormous part of the self yeah. this sensory motor part of the self and really really valuable the sensory part of it mm -hmm. i think it can be very easy to end up focusing way too much on the idea of movement okay um and of course uh you know the eyes are moving all the time we, we are you know movement very subtly is happening all the way through the system the whole time mm -hmm. but the sensory process is also in itself valuable to pay attention to could you say a bit more about that so to help people understand what you mean so so we had so the we had two homunculi we had the motor homunculi that was showing the neurological territory um connected to movement yeah so hands do a lot of complicated interesting movements anytime you're using a tool anytime you're manipulating the world you're mm. making interesting shapes with your hands and that it that processing is going on all the time mm. uh, obviously once you've met if you're someone who knits yeah then you're you there's less processing needed taken to, to be taken up once you've learned to knit in the process of learning to knit you're using a lot of the territory because you're figuring out how to manipulate these new tools and this new medium of wool in a, a, a specific way. So, but harder to talk about and harder to make sense of perhaps is the sensory part of it. Yeah. That, that, that what you're feeling on the surface of the skin of your hands is also very significant. We have an astonishing capacity to refine our senses. Our fingertips can sense something that is 13 nanometers thick. Now there are bacteria that are bigger than that. So it's 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 all it requires for us to do this is that we are put through a training process that allows us to pay attention to the tiny sense of vibration we feel with the fingertips. And what was interesting about that study for me is I doubt that they had really taken on board that the people were learning. Mm -hmm. I think what they thought as they made each interaction with a smaller and smaller item and then were still finding that people could feel it with their fingers right down to these 13 nanometers, this tiny amount, mm -hmm. um, that if they had continued some of those people might even have been able to get smaller and smaller and smaller as they refined their senses. Yeah. Um, I'll give you another example that maybe is um, uh, perhaps a bit more complex and might need, you might have more questions about, but when I first started the training, I was not a visualizer. Mm -hmm. I don't, I didn't easily get images in my head. Um, I mostly think in words. That's that's the way my brain works. Mm. Um, and I was I had become aware that I didn't have pictures. I didn't easily see images. Now, not only do I see images in my mind's eye, but they're very, very distinct and very precise. Um, I've gone from being what would be described as the poorest level of visualizing right up to the sort of three dimensional, fully technicolor. Uh, version of visualizing somehow through the process of doing Feldenkrais and what's frustrating is I don't remember the change because it was only when I started working in this area where I got so interested in the meditative process that I realized that the change had happened so mm -hmm. at some point doing Feldenkrais this sensory uh, an, an element of sensory awareness improved for me mm -hmm. in a really major way without me even tracking it, certainly without me intentionally learning it. So, I mean, I mean, this, this is a fascinating subject. I feel like this is something that we could kind of dig into quite a lot, but I'm, I'm wondering if I relate it back to the subject of meditation and quietness, that there's something that you're talking about here, which is more actually to do with the neurological system 
um, and a neurological level of um, quietness that maybe is like um, a reduction of the stimulation, overall stimulation of our neurological or nervous system, which allows then uh, degrees of sensitivity to improve, um, which has a net benefit as well, right? Yes, uh, yes. But, I mean, I don't know if that kind of makes, if that's a useful connection at this point, but it sounds to me like you're talking very specifically about how active our neurological state is and that as we quieten that system or it, something quietens, then our senses refine and that has a positive impact to how we also engage with life and are able to receive new information. And I mean, you even mentioned earlier that it had some change in your uh, social relationships as well on your training. Yeah. Um, yes, so which I think was a lowering of anxiety. Right. Yeah, exactly. Which is a, a form of stimulation in the system, right? There's some, you said you were on high alert. So yeah. something is very active in the system. And some of these processes that you're talking about allowed that activation to become less. Mm. And that, that had a net benefit. And I'm sorry, the sun is, I'm just going <laughs> to close my curtain quickly. Yes, I can see it's gone very bright. There you go. <laughs> we can see how nice the yellow uh, color of the wall is now <laughs> let's change the background um yes yes isn't this complex um and i don't want it to be so complex that people go oh no this isn't this isn't interesting it's too too finickety so i used to talk about the weber fechner law or the fechner weber law i noticed that people do it both ways around this um this element of the way we process sensory information that um, he used, I think, to explain the value of moving slowly and gently and paying lots of attention to very tiny changes. Um, and I think the example he used to use, um, uh, I think the simplest example perhaps to understand is the one where you imagine yourself in a room that's completely dark Mm -hmm. And then what you get one candle lit and that one candle makes a huge difference to what you can see your sensory, your capacity to process visually from just one candle, um, one uh, amount, the amount of light you get from one candle is very powerful. But we are refined in our visual sense enough that if you light another candle and another candle and another candle, we can see the increase in the light all the way up to 40 candles. Mm -hmm. But once there are 40 candles in the room, if you light a 41st, you won't see the difference. You will, you, there's now too much light for that small amount of extra light to be um, uh, detectable. And then he would talk about, you know, if you're carrying a, uh, 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 something on your back and a fly lands on it, you won't feel it. But if you hold out your hand and a fat and a fly lands on it, you will feel it. I think that was the example he used. And I think this is it. What we're doing with our work is helping people get better and better at refining, sensing both, you know, tiny changes in movement, but also, you know, I think, you know, to use the um, lovely lessons that he uh, designed for working with the eyes. Mm. And because of my own fascination with voice and sound, to, I'm attempting to bring that same refinement into working with sounds that we can make and sounds that we can hear. Mm. Um, uh, because um, particularly sight and sound and touch are very, very powerful. And I, I, I feel that they're all there's the potential for all of them to be present um, in what we do in our work. And indeed we are training people to listen because we're, we're giving them very careful instruction that they're following. So in that level of listening, language level of listening, um, people are, everyone, every Feldenkrais practitioner is using that sort of process. But Feldenkrais talked very specifically about learning to think in ways that don't lean heavily on language. Mm. And, and I think we can do that through a sensory attention. Mm. Or one mm. of the ways we can do that is through a sensory attention. Well, to me, that feels like a, a nice sort of a conclusion to what we've talked about so far. 
<laughs> I don't know if you if you know if you had any final thoughts um that you wanted to share with people. Um the platform is open to you. So. What a what a nice open open thought. Uh, yes, that I, I think we I, I think we can embrace how powerful this work is um for the senses as well as for movement. I, I, I would like to hear Thumbcrest described less as as a movement training and much more widely as a sort of complex neurological training. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Well yeah, I mean it to me after that discussion it's quite clear that the the connection between meditation and Feldenkrais and that there's quite a, a almost like a step by step process that you can go through as you engage with the Feldenkrais method that would lead you to some of the benefits that meditation is aiming towards yeah. um, without even intending it just exactly. just naturally achieving it yeah 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 okay well um thank you so much Maggie I really do appreciate thank your time. you um, we uh, we have uh, in this edition we have a couple of articles um, as well um, so please uh, if you haven't already sign up for the newsletter and you will get access to those as well Maggie will be providing her website details and hopefully uh, an awareness through movement lesson as well as part of this which we will link to um, I'm hopeful that maybe she will provide a bell hand lesson if she has one because we've talked about it a little bit or even mm -hmm. so um, I'll just put that suggestion out. <laughs> um, but yeah, again, thank you, Maggie. I really do appreciate your time. Um, and I hope everyone enjoyed the discussion. Yes, I hope so too. Yeah, yeah. I look forward to seeing the edition myself. <laughs> thank you. Thanks, Maggie.